Hi, I'm Charles Hu from Scottsdale Osborne Medical Center. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Miller. He's the Professor of Surgery and Division Chief of Trauma and Critical Care at Vanderbilt. He's going to talk to us about compassion fatigue, the road to a burnout. Dr. Miller. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank, uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you today about a very important topic, in my opinion, and uh, what Dr. Stewart alluded to earlier, and that's compassion fatigue. How many people really know what compassion fatigue is? Raise your hand. Not that many. And I'm sure after this talk, we'll see how many people raise their hands and have actually suffered from compassion fatigue during their career. Um, I don't have anything to disclose. Um, I'm going to show you some intense um, pictures of patients that I've taken care of over the last 25 years um, that I believe that I um, suffer from compassion fatigue even before I knew what it was. Um, after I finished my fellowship at Vanderbilt in uh, 1992, I moved to Greenville, South Carolina and ran a level one community hospital. And this is one of the first patients that I took care of that had significant injuries. Clemson University is just down the street from Greenville, and this young 18-year-old uh, student uh, was riding her Volkswagen Rabbit down the interstate on a hot summer day, and it was after it rained. She hydroplaned her car onto the other side of the interstate and crashed into a school bus, and she was under that school bus for several hours. Her injury severity score was 65. Universally, 75 is, has 100% mortality, so her mortality was about 90% transected aorta, major chest and abdominal injuries, ruptured, ruptured spleen, liver injuries, and she arrived moribund with a blood pressure of 50. And uh, I did the resuscitation that my boss, John Morris, taught me at uh, Vanderbilt, and PJ uh, uh, was my fellow, and in the early uh, 90s, we gave lots of crystalloid um, until they were adequately resuscitated. And this is what she looked like at the end of that resuscitation. Um, and that was, 20, 30 liters of crystalloid, fixed her aorta, bilateral chest tubes, took her spleen out, packed her belly. She had all four lung bones uh, fractured. She had an open pelvic fracture. Um, and I was reported to the ICU committee for having the patient look like this. And the, I said, well, the patient can either look like this and be alive, or she can look like all of us and be dead. And so... Um, for job security, I sat by her bedside for the next three days to ensure that she didn't die. And it's rented fluid, and an 18-year-old has incredible physiologic reserve. And after um, several months of recovery and uh, giving back that fluid, she looked like this. And then it's pretty hard for you to tell her from her sister, which one is she, on the left or the right? Well, um, it's on the left just because of that little trach scar. And uh, so this is when she was 18, and with the miracle of the internet and um, IT savvy daughters, um, my daughters found uh, Heidi Huber. She lives in the Midwest. She's now 41, and she has two little girls of her, of her own, exactly two and a half years apart, just like my daughters, and doing extremely well. But I can tell you, it was um, a very intense time resuscitating her. Uh, and I believe during that time with her family, I suffer from compassion fatigue. So originally, uh, compassion fatigue was alluded to discussions that nurses had in counselors. It was first diagnosed in ICU nurses in the 1950s, but it was only until the 1980s that Charles Figley started to describe this entity on people that were constantly exposed to other families and patients suffering. And the other name for compassion fatigue is called secondary traumatic stress disorder. We work with a population of patients who experience incredible traumatic events. Our days are incredibly stressful. They're jam-packed. And we need to be compassionate every single day because that's what we do. We take care of patients and we want them to do well. The definition of compassion fatigue is a phenomenon that occurs when caregivers feel overwhelmed by repeated empathetic engagements with distressed patients and their families. It is a form, an early form of burnout that manifests itself by physical, 
emotional and spiritual exhaustion. We deliver a lot of bad news and we're exposed for prolonged periods of time in dealing with very difficult issues and critically ill and injured patients, people that die, angry patients and families that project their anger onto us. We see a lot of psychopathology, that's a subgroup of patients that we take care of, and a lot of them have permanent lifestyle changes, one of which I've known for a long time now. When I moved back to Vanderbilt in 2002, this young girl was our banker. When my wife and I arrived, she set up our banking, our mortgage. She was on her first date riding on the back of a motorcycle and an 18-wheeler overcompensated, came onto their side, knocked Tammy off the motorcycle and she flew up in the air and impaled her perineum onto the back bumper of the 18-wheeler and basically split her in half. So through the vagina, the rectum, the bladder, pubic symphysis and her half of her abdominal wall were on the highway. And she was awake and alert and transported by our life flight team to Vanderbilt and rarely do they call us up to the helipad to say a patient needs to go immediately to the operating room. But in this case, and of course I happened to be on call, went up to the helipad and Tammy was still awake and alert and looked up at me and said, Rick, don't let me die. And that fear of impending doom when you're bleeding to death is real. And I'm not going to show you the pictures of what we dealt with at the beginning, but um, remarkably through an incredible team approach with multiple physicians and healthcare providers, we got her to the point um, where she stayed alive. We reconstructed her left side of her abdominal wall with biologics. Um, her rectum was completely annihilated, so she has a permanent colostomy, and her bladder was crushed, and so she has an ileoconduit. And uh, so she cannulates the conduit three or four times a day to empty her urine, and she knows what to eat, so she can just wear a Band-Aid on her colostomy, and she's back to working as an executive. And she's really a very robust, um, full-of-life um, young lady uh, who I've now known through most of my career. And uh, here she is, uh, horsebell riding. She's uh, not only an executive banker, but she is a professional horsebell rider. And she's won the Southeast uh, Championships in horseback riding several years in a row. She was also honored at Life Flight's annual um, uh, patient support. Uh, she goes out and talks about biologics and resuscitations for us. And here she is with my wife, uh, and we've remained very good friends until then. But in talking to her, I can tell you that um, she still has a lot of problems, psychological and physical, that she has to live with every day. And so I think of Tammy and uh, appreciate the things that we have in life because she has to live with what she has. This is probably the, one of the more sensational cases that I took uh, uh, care of. This was 10 years ago. Um, Michael's the same age as me. He was a train car hitch manager and he was helping um, hitch a train car together and the train hitch broke and he got crushed between the two train cars. And his entire hemipelvis was completely uh, flattened and including his uh, uh, groin, perineum, and the entire left hemipelvis, and required over 200 units of blood and blood products to get him through it. And uh, this is what he looked like after uh, multiple operations and skin grafting. He has biologics that's created a, a urethra for him, and he had a diverting ileostomy, and, uh, but his rectum was normal. He wanted to reverse the ileostomy, and he said, Dr. Miller, I want to go back to work. And I went, Michael, you've got to be kidding me. We've gone through all of these things, and now you have to undergo a major reconstruction, take the skin graft off, reverse the ileostomy. He says, I just want to go back to work and be normal. And so you can see my signature up at the top. We, uh, um, this was a big team approach. We reconstructed his abdomen, closed his ileostomy. Um, we had to put um, biologics over part of his abdominal wall. But as you can see, every single day when we walked in the room, he thanked us for what we did. He gave us the big thumbs up. And as you can see, when I took this picture, uh oh, when I took this picture, um, it's kind of freaky, but he's got a halo around his head. He truly is um, an angel for me because uh, he has uh, taught me how to appreciate the small things in life. And we simply skin grafted that area, and he found a prosthetic co company that fit him with this amazing hydraulic uh, prosthesis, and when he puts his pants on, he looks pretty normal. 
except his arms are like the size of my thighs. He's solid. I think about Michael every single day. So there really is a cost to caring for these type of patients. And Charles Frigley says that um, there is a cost to caring. Those who have enormous capacity for feeling and expressing empathy, like all of us in this room, tend to be at the greatest risk for compassion stress. It is a process. It evolves over time. But if you don't take care of it, it will catch up with you in the long run. We're empathetic, we're exposed to suffering, we're concerned about the patients and their family. We have appropriate empathetic response, but if you're exposed to it too much, you start detaching yourself and depersonalizing yourself to these people that are exposed to you every single day. There's a lot of satisfaction in taking care of these people, but if you continually are exposed to it without taking care of yourself and have prolonged exposures to everyone suffering, this is retained in your brain, and along with every, all the other life's demands can lead to compassion fatigue, which in this case was a really big one and probably the most um, memorable for me. Uh, when I took care of trauma patients in Greenville, I took care of everybody, kids. There were really no pediatric surgeons that um, were available to take care of kids. Uh, uh, Kaylin was a four-year-old at the time that uh, was at an Easter egg hunt at her school, her preschool, um, and uh, she was uh, placed in the front seat of a mini a van that was on an incline, and uh, one of the kids went through the side door, knocked it out of gear, and Caitlin fell out of the car, and the car uh, started rolling backwards and rolled onto Caitlin's chest and abdomen. And so she was the bumper for the, uh, for the minivan. And I remember her mom telling me that all these people came and lifted the minivan off of Caitlin, and she came into our trauma bay blue and moribund with a little um, Easter egg tattoo on her cheek and these big brown eyes and dying in front of me. She had incredible injuries, uh, and uh, her rectum was um, avulsed and uh, um, prolapsed. She had massive resuscitation, and she was in the peds ICU with a tense abdomen after that big resuscitation, and um, a decompression for abdominal compartment syndrome hadn't been done, certainly not at Greenville, and in the literature I looked, it had never been done for trauma before, and I told her mom, I think the only way we can keep her alive is to decompress her abdomen and form a silo. And she already found out my two kids' names, uh, Stephanie and Alyssa, and she said, if Stephanie and Alyssa were in this situation, what would you do? So she personalized it after I depersonalized it, which really messed with my brain. And uh, so we decompressed her. I said, of course, we would do it. And her lungs were crushed. They were a snowstorm. And I knew we only had a limited period of time to take care of this little girl. And the only ECMO in the state was in Charleston on the other side of the state. And I called my friend Doug Norcross, and I said, Doug, I need your help. I got a little kid that's dying, and I need her to be on ECMO. And he says, I'm sending a team, and they'll be there in an hour and a half. And on a Learjet, I had a pediatric surgeon, an intensivist, a respiratory therapist, and uh, I uh, told uh, Kaylin's mom that the only way I think she could survive is to get her over to Charleston. And she said, well, if this was Stephanie or Alyssa, what would you do? And I said, I'd send her. So I called the chief of police. It was 11 o'clock at night. And I said, I, I can't have any obstructions to the transport of this little girl to the airport. And he said, I'll take care of it. And this is where community team comes into play and we got Kaylin into the ambulance and every single intersection from the hospital to the airport was blocked by a police car with a siren on it. I still remember that every single day and get emotional every time I talk about that because it's an incredible feat. And so a respiratory therapist and I were at the end of the runway as the Learjet took off. And I'm not a hugely religious guy, but I'm pretty spiritual. And I said, please, God, just let her make it to Charleston alive. And I sat upright with my wife um, in bed, and uh, we just waited for the phone call. And she actually made it uh, to Charleston. She was on ECMO for 10 days, never been done before with an open abdomen. Um, here she is bagging herself in Charleston. And uh, just look at those, remember those brown eyes. Um, and then um, 
She survived. She did well. She had a colostomy, and then she came back to Greenville, and I was going to reverse her colostomy. And her, um, I remember, I have a long hallway to my clinic, and her mom whispered in her ear and said, that's Dr. Miller, because she certainly didn't know me. And uh, she jumped into my arms and said, thanks for saving my life. Remember those brown eyes. She was South Carolina's Miracle Child of the Year, and also with the... Uh, great uh, daughters I have. Uh, they found her now um, 20 years later. She's 24, and here she is today. And um, I was lucky enough for both her mom and her to join me in giving this talk in uh, um, Roanoke at Carilion Medical Center, and she was in the audience, and uh, when I pointed her out and she stood up, there wasn't a single dry eye in the audience. Pretty cool. So what's the incidence of compassion fatigue? Now you're going to know. Raise your hand now if you think you suffer from compassion fatigue. It's about 85% of people that take care of patients that we take care of. At some time, you feel no longer that you have any compassion left to give. It takes its toll on decreased productivity, more sick days, and high turnover. And this is where you don't want to get. You don't want to have so much compassion fatigue that it leads to burnout, which is a syndrome of psychological and physical exhaustion, diminished efficiency resulting from constantly being exposed to this prolonged stress. And then when you have symptoms of burnout, um, it can cause tremendous problems, and us as surgeons don't recognize that. And I think that's how one of my partners uh, died a few years ago from suffering so much compassion fatigue that he just couldn't take it anymore. And I knew it. There's a lot of factors conducive to burnout. We know that we have to balance our life, and there's a lot of workload. And about 50% of physicians that take care of this type of patients have some sort of burnout with depersonalization, loss of enthusiasm, and low personal accomplishment. So what do you do about it? First, you've got to recognize that you're wearing down. Come to the terms of all these suppressed feelings that you had even when you started your education. And Many medical students say that they've suffered from compassion fatigue. And you've got to do something for yourself every day. It's not easy. We get comfortable in our bad habits, and we may need to make big lifestyle changes. So understand that this is a normal phenomenon for all of us. Even us guys, we have to understand that this is normal, and it will go away if you take care of yourselves. First, find a good listener. And men are not as good listeners as women, so we've got to work at it. It's a, it's, a, it's a genetic thing. We only have one small area in our temporal lobe that lights up when we listen, while women have these two giant areas in their temporal lobes. Find someone that you can relate to. Spend some time alone. Learn mindful meditation, which is another whole lecture. It's amazing how you'll be able to get this balance, and you can get a turnaround. Recharge your batteries. Hold one focused, connected, meaningful conversation every day. Mindfulness and meditation and yoga are actually really good for you. So to sum up, let me just show you how I've taken care of myself. Uh, over these 25 years and taking care of 50,000 patients. Appreciate the beauty around you. Just waking up this morning, you've got it in your backyard. This is Telluride where the Western Trauma meets last year in a different ski resort. We have friends, family, it's an amazing place for me. This is my area of mindful mediation, meditation. Um, it's hiking and biking trails on a huge area in Nashville. I'm a big triathlete fan. I have lots of friends that are triathletes. We talk about lots of other things besides medicine. My wife and I love to entertain, and we have food therapy. We have SEC therapy. My paycheck comes from Vanderbilt, but my daughter went to Auburn. When Auburn was winning 26 nothing. I took my hat off. <laughs> Spend time with your kids. They grow up really fast. Spend quality time with your spouse and significant other. Have fun with your family. Celebrate milestones. This is my father-in-law, who's now 92. 
have some sort of spirituality. I'm Jewish, my wife's Episcopalian. You see us lighting the Hanukkah candles, but in the background you can see the Christmas tree and the stockings on the fireplace. And my daughters have taken full advantage of this. <laughs> Give back to your community. These are high school students that come and shadow us every year, and 75% of the people, that these girls that shadow us, go into medicine. It's a huge, huge reward for us. This is my biggest therapy running in the park with my dog, Sadie. We go three times a week. Every time I say, Sadie, you want to go for a run, it's like elation, elation. And the rewards are priceless. So don't be ICD-10 code Z73.0. <laughs> Prioritize your time. Go with urgent and important things, and you are the most urgent and important thing. Manage your time, drop the guilt, learn to say no, outsource onerous tasks. Develop some emotional awareness. Connect with others, find meaning in your work, and prioritize your personal wellness, which is both physical and mental wellness. You've got to take care of yourself before you take care of your patients. Never lose your sense of humor despite the fact that we take care of really sick people. Be passionate about your work and you'll never have to call it a job. I've been doing this a long time and I still love to come to work every single day. I love what I do, I love teaching residents and fellows, my partners are amazing, and we are now recognized when we are wearing down and tell each other to take a break. If you do that and you have a great team around you, the most important thing is that it'll benefit your patients. Thank you very much.